So I'm going to look at a question from the January 2011 paper, and it's a section B question, so it's a more essay type question. So it says here part A, health is defined by the World Health Organization as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Well disease is the loss of health brought about by an association between the person and a disease agent. So what they've done here, they have already given you the definitions for health and disease. And these are definitions that you should know about. So the question here, part one, two categories of disease are degenerative and inherited. Name two other categories of disease and the factors that cause them. So before I go on to the other categories, you should be familiar with the two that are already named here, degenerative and inherited. So a degenerative disease can also be referred to as a, a physiological disease. So this pretty much means that there is a breakdown in the function. There's some kind of malfunction in an organ or tissue. So that is what degenerative means. So degenerative diseases are usually chronic, meaning that it is long term. So common degenerative diseases would include diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular diseases. So anything like that that usually progresses and can worsen over a long period of time, especially if it's not treated. Now, on the other hand, the next category, inherited. So this means that the disease is passed down from parents to offspring. So the genes, so defective genes can be passed from the parents to the actual individual that inherits the disease. So common diseases that are inherited would be sickle cell anemia, hemophilia, and albinism. So those are two categories that you should be familiar with. And then the other two categories, so let's look at the answers for those. So we have deficiency diseases. So these are the diseases caused by a lack of specific nutrients in the diet. So nutrients would in, include the macronutrients such as carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, and then also the micronutrients such as vitamins and minerals. So common examples of deficiency diseases would be anemia, scurvy, rickets. So anemia is caused by a lack of iron, scurvy is caused by a lack of vitamin C, and rickets is caused by a lack of vitamin D and iron. So those are deficiency diseases. So obviously to treat deficiency diseases, you would need to actually have the particular nutrient, make sure that that is implemented in the diet. So if it's lacking in the diet, the individual needs to include it in the diet. So they have a diet rich in that particular nutrient. Or they can also use supplements that would provide the nutrient that is missing from the diet. Now the second category of disease here would be infectious or pathogenic diseases. So these are the diseases caused by pathogens. So pathogens tend to be microorganisms such as viruses, bacteria, fungi, protozoa. So they actually cause disease when they get into your body. So ringworm is an example of a fungal disease that affects the skin. Dengue is a viral disease and HIV is also a viral disease. And there are plenty other examples that you can mention for infectious diseases. So those are the two categories of diseases there. All right, let's look at part two. Say one substance that may trigger an asthma attack and name one form of treatment. So say one substance that may trigger an asthma attack. So we're looking at triggers of asthma what can cause asthma and then you have to give a form of treatment so let's look at the answers now so pollen perfume animal fur dust smoke these are common triggers that can cause an asthma attack so you can name any of those they only ask for one so any of those you can mention so asthma really is a, it's caused by a hyperactive immune system. So these, these um, triggers generally would not cause harm to the body, like how pathogens would cause disease. But in the asthmatic, their immune system is extra sensitive. So that is what causes the immune to, re, to respond, the immune system to respond in such a way to these harmless substances that would be triggers for the asthma attack. 
Now, in terms of treatment, I have two options for treatment. So they only ask for one. So asthmatics can be treated by using a bronchodilator. So this is what is commonly known as an inhaler. You see asthmatics walking around with them. So the bronchodilator is really meant to dilate the bronchial tubes. So that's where the name originates. So it helps to dilate the tubes, the airways, so that the air can pass through a little more freely. Now the nebulizer, on the other hand, will be a, a piece of device, a device that you place over the person's um, nose, their entire um, nose and mouth, and that would allow them to inhale the medicine or the chemicals that would help to relax the muscles lining the airways. So the nebulizer may often be given if the asthmatic um, has to go to the hospital, they may give it to them in such a case if it gets really, really bad. So the nebulizer would also work to open up the airways, to dilate, to dilate those um, airways so that the air can pass through more freely. All right, so that answers part two. So let's look at part B. Regine is five years old and is about to enter primary school. His parents are informed that before he starts school, he must receive all of his vaccinations. Explain to Regine's parents why he needs to receive his vaccinations. So let's look at the explanation for this. So you should have an understanding the need for vaccinations. So they are preventative measures to protect an individual against infectious diseases. So remember the diseases caused by pathogens. So Regine needs to ensure that he, he gets, well, his parents need to ensure that he gets the necessary vaccinations to help build up his immune system and prepare the immune system to fight off effectively the pathogens that enter his body. Because he's going to be exposed to many various um, pathogens, especially when he goes to school for the first time, primary school for the first time. So it's important that he receives all the necessary vaccines to help build up his immune system, prepare his immune system for any possible attacks when he's exposed to pathogens. So that is the purpose of getting the vaccines. All right, let's look at part C. So Regine was born with some immunity from his mother. Describe the type of immunity that Regine would have received from his mother and compare it with the type of immunity he would receive from his vaccinations. So basically what they're asking you to do is to compare the two different types of immunity. The one he gets from his mother versus the one he receives from his vaccinations. So let's look at the explanation for that. So Regine would have received natural passively acquired immunity from his mother. So this means that when she was pregnant with Regine, the antibodies would have crossed over the placenta and get into Regine's blood. So that is how he would have received antibodies against certain diseases that the mother may have already had. And then antibodies can also be passed on after birth through breastfeeding. So the milk would contain some antibodies. So those are two ways that the antibodies can be transferred from Regine's mother to him, so during and then after birth. So this is natural passively acquired immunity. So this type of immunity is usually short-lived or temporary, so it doesn't last for a long time. So this is the reason why it is necessary for Regine to get the vaccinations. Now the vaccinations on the other hand would deliver artificial actively acquired immunity. So vaccines, this is going to be involved, vaccines contain live but weakened pathogens. So you have the pathogens, they may be alive, but they're weakened so they don't actually cause harm to the body. Or in some cases, some vaccines may contain dead pathogens. The main thing is that the vaccines contain the pathogen, the pathogen which actually is carrying the antigens on its surface, so that is what usually would, would trigger or stimulate an immune response. So that's the purpose of the vaccines, is to stimulate an immune response where the lymphocytes, so remember lymphocytes are the white blood cells, so they produce antibodies 
So they produce antibodies when they recognize the antigens. So I just mentioned the antigens. They are found on the surface of the pathogens. So there are these protein molecules that are found on the surface of the pathogens and they trigger the immune response. So they cause the lymphocytes to produce antibodies because they recognize that the pathogens are foreign based on the antigens they have on the surface. So because the lymphocytes recognize that the pathogens are foreign, that is when they would produce the antibodies. So they produce the antibodies against that pathogen. So this is known as the primary response. So when you get the vaccine, you have this primary response occurring and you typically obviously would not get any signs or symptoms of the disease. So this primary response tends to be slower than the next type of response, the secondary response, which I'll look at now. So the purpose of the vaccine is to really prepare the immune system and allow the lymphocytes in the body to develop a memory of the antigens. So they want to develop a record of the antigens of the pathogens that would have entered the body the first time around. So the primary response, the first time that the pathogen entered the body. So that is through the vaccine. So think of the vaccine as the first time that the pathogen is entering the body. So the vaccine prepares for the real deal and it does so by creating a memory of the antigens of the pathogens. So remember, okay, well this, this pathogen was in the body before. It remembers that the antigens found on the pathogens, they were, they were present in the body before. So now if Regine is exposed to the real pathogen, so if he, you know, encounters some individual with a particular disease, say chicken pox, for example, so if he is around someone with chicken pox and he had already gotten the chicken pox vaccine, um, this time around when he's exposed to the real chicken pox virus, his body is going to recognize that, that virus much faster and produce the antibodies much faster. So now this is known as the secondary response. So therefore, because the antibodies will be produced much quickly, much more quickly, Regine is not going to actually get the signs and symptoms of the disease. So he, he has that protection because of the vaccine. So think of it this way. So remember the vaccine is providing what would be known as the primary response. So this is not the real pathogen. This is the false pathogen just trying to prepare the body for the real deal. So the primary response would tend to be a little slower so that the second time or the subsequent time that the pathogen enters the body, you have um, a, the secondary response now, the second time or a subsequent time, this response will be much faster. So this is what prevents the individual from actually getting the signs and symptoms of the disease. And with artificial actively acquired immunity, it is usually long lasting and it, it, it lasts for a long time and offers that long-term protection against the, the disease. So it's different to the natural passively acquired immunity. So natural passively acquired immunity is more short-term, while the artificial actively acquired immunity is more long-term. So for instance, using the example of chicken pox again, usually when you get chicken pox, when you get um, chicken pox, it, it, it makes you immune for life, usually for life. So in this case, if, if uh, Regine was to get a chicken pox vaccine and if he was to encounter the real chicken pox virus, he has a long term, a lifelong immunity against chicken pox. So just using chicken pox as an example. All right, so that answers that part of the question. So we've actually completed this question five on the January 2011 paper. If you found this video helpful, feel free to subscribe, like, and share. And don't forget to hit that notification bell.